Gabriella Chilmy grew up in the suburbs of Melbourne, eating pasta at her nonna's house and attending the nearby school. Nothing out of the ordinary, really, unless you were to rifle through her parents' record collection. Nina Simone, Janis Joplin, Led Zeppelin and Blondie. That kind of soundtrack has to rub off. Now they're calling her the next big thing and Australia's answer to Amy Winehouse. All that and she's just 16. With a number one single under her belt and an acclaimed album that's just entered the top ten in Britain, we welcome Gabriella Chilmy to 9am. Good morning, Gabriella. Good morning, Gabriella. Good morning. Have you any idea how your success must be a worry to your parents right at this moment? <laughs> oh, yeah, probably. <laughs> do they, what, what do they think about what's going on in your life? Oh, I think, you know, they're pretty proud and stuff, you know, I'm, I'm pretty lucky that they actually let me do it because yeah. they could have just said, you know, make sure you finish, you know, school. I'm still doing school by correspondence, but, you know, they're supportive. Yeah. There's a, a fantastic story that I was reading in the notes about you that you've actually been signed to a record label for, you, had, you were under contract for quite a while, but you didn't tell your mates about it. Now, just at the beginning, because I didn't want, you know, everything to kind of, you know, because sometimes the music industry is a bit fickle and you don't know whether things are going to work out or not, so I, I didn't tell them just in case. And so when you were off recording and working with writers and all that sort of, what did you, what did you tell them? I said I was going to, like, Queensland or something, or, like, you know, make up something. But then one of my mates rang me and I had to tell her that her phone call was costing, like, a fortune because <laughs> we were in London. Yeah. But, um, so after that I told them all and, yeah. Was there a moment... I listened to your album for the first time last night and it's a fantastic record and you can sit there and you can listen to it and you'd swear you were listening to someone... 20, 30 years old. It's, your voice has, has this maturity. Was, what happened? Why? why I, <laughs> I, I mentioned, so, it, I mentioned yeah. some of those influences or, or, yeah. or the, the, the records that your parents yeah, had. I, I think it was just kind of like what my mum used to play. Like she used to, you know, love Janis Joplin and we used to watch like, say, Cat Stevens on like VHS and stuff. We used to put it on and I used to really just love watching them play. And um, I was just one of those people who used to, you know, sing around the house and just annoy everyone, like, you know, bathroom really, really loud. Yeah. And of course, you know, like, and my mum also used to like Susie Quacho, so at one stage she was like my idol, she used to scream all the time. I, I, can, <laughs> I can actually, uh, there are a couple of tracks on the, the record that sound just like Susie Quacho. I mean, are you, are you aware of that influence or do you step up to the microphone or do you write a song thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach this like uh, Susie Quacho? Oh, not really. I kind of approach it as if I'm writing it for myself because I'm sure, you know, I'm not Susie Quattro and the things, you know, that was kind of how, you know, 30 years ago, for, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a different time now. So you have to make sure that music's like suitable for today as well, which tried to kind of bring, you know, my influences from back then and kind of make it modern as well. So, Or, or maybe you're intellectualising it too much. Maybe it's just your dodgy posture. Yeah, I know, yeah, because I, I did go to an orthodontist once and he said, not orthodontist, it's called osteopath. osteopath, I don't know yeah. what I'm talking about. Um, and he told me because my back was kind of bent that um, that's why I could sing or something and he's like, I'll fix your back but I'll make sure you can sing still or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, so, so he, he thought it was the, the, the crooked, slightly crooked yeah, back or...? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like... And is it true that, you, that initially your singing teachers thought maybe you didn't have the chutzpah to... Oh, no, it was actually my, it in the my piano teacher told me I had no musicality when I was, like, eight, which is... <laughs> no, it's What's pretty her name? Bad thing to, I can't remember her name. She had red hair. That's all I remember. You, she but, should um, just take a listen to this record. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> what happened? How did, how did this all start? Because it takes some time to, put, to, to write songs, to get a record together. You've co-written or written all of the songs on this, on this album here. Yeah. How long ago did you start putting the record together? Well, I, I kind of started three years ago. Um, At the guess, age of 13? Yeah, kind of 13-ish. And I, I used to start on my... Um, school, used to go up on my school holidays and record and kind of come back and forth. From... We, and where were you recording at that point? Um, my first trip was in LA and we actually recorded in a toilet in LA because apparently the sound was really good in there. And like, That's this flash. is really glamorous. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um... Were you standing up or were you sitting down? <laughs> Um, I was standing up <laughs> and um, then I kind of went to London and I actually recorded, you know, most of the album in the house of Alice Little, who Alice in Wonderland. I read um, that. Yeah, the character was based on this, this lady. This was, you know, her real life house. It's this beautiful kind of old English home and like, I think it was like the youngest person living in this small little village. Because it's really funny, it's really tea and scones. Yeah, kind of. yeah, yeah. And you were there with some pretty hefty producers, weren't you? 
Yeah, they've worked with you know, a lot of people like, you know, Girls Aloud and Sugar Babes, kind of this really is pop acts. Yeah. Mm. Uh, different to kind of, you know, what I used to listen to and I kind of used to jam in the garage with my mates and we used to play like Led Zeppelin covers and Jet covers and King so, Leon covers. Well, where, where, does, where, did the, where did you meet or how did you meet? How did you uh, um, I, inspire them to follow you and vice versa? Um, I think we kind of hooked up. When I, when I went to LA, we kind of, um, we knew someone we both knew, like, we had a friend in common and um, we got talking and he really loved Australia and um, I was there kind of playing to different record companies to see if anyone would sign me over there and, I don't know, it just happened that, yeah. Because it's, I've read some quotes from Brian Higgins, who's one half of the Xenomania team, and, and he was saying that, that they were really conscious of wanting to develop you slowly and carefully and not just churn you out like a sausage yeah. factory. I think I really needed those three years to kind of, you know, I guess develop and grow. Or, you know, I think I, I really wanted to write my album so I could, you know, believe whatever I was, I was kind of selling, so. That's but quite... Also, but, sorry. But, but also I was going to say, with that, you, you mentioned that before that you were, you were really heavily into rock, they also shown, showed you another style, yeah, didn't sense, they? Yeah, I guess, because before I kind of, you know, started working with them, I used to kind of, you know, want to scream all the time, and um, he kind of showed me, I was, I was really obsessed with Led Zeppelin, and I still kind of am, and that's not a bad thing. Yeah, no, no it's, it's a good a thing. thing. And he, he played me the Rain song, and he's like, well, even Led Zeppelin have a sensitive side, so I'm like, OK, maybe I can try something different too, so... It's good, isn't it? It's, it's really encouraging to hear that the, the music industry will, will take the time out to nurture somebody, yeah. you know, yeah. at your age. But mm. are there, is there a downside to that? Do you find, because you're 16, that the music industry wants to mother you? And control you too much? Do you get do you get that at all? No, I haven't had any of that. Like, you know, I'm pretty in charge of you know what I do, and I have like good people around me who, yeah, we've agreed and on your mom, most things your mom so far. Goes with you, doesn't she? Yeah, my mum or like my auntie or you know, someone's mm. always with me. So. Mm. And what? And so at the moment you are you are you have a band and you are playing. Yeah, um, I've got my band with me down from the UK and. Um, half of the band's Australian, half of them are English, and we're touring with James Blunt at the moment, playing at the Rod Laver Arena tonight, which is really cool. I know, and you're looking forward, because as, as I, um, you were telling me in the break, you've got some schoolmates there who are coming along to cheer you on. Yeah, exactly. So hopefully I don't see them in the crowd, because then I'll just, be, like, I'll just laugh my head off. Speaking of school, you're also, um, you're also really conscious of continuing your education as well, aren't you? Yeah, I think, you know, I always kind of wanted to just, you know, finish my, my VCE, just do Year 12, so I don't regret anything. Mm. And I don't look back and say, oh, I wish I did that. So, mm. yeah. Was there a moment, as we, as we said in the introduction, there was a... <laughs> the, the, the single's gone to number one in the UK, the album is now number ten. I mean, it's phenomenal. It's, it's phenomenally successful already. What changed? Why is it successful? Was there a moment in the UK that suddenly launched everything for you? I think... Um, I don't know if there was a moment, it kind of, at the, begin, at the end of last year I performed on Jules Holland which is like this renowned music show and um, I've, kind of, I've always used to watch it like religiously, stay up until like 12 to like watch it and like people like Cat Stevens mm. have been on. Everybody, and, yeah. And everyone's been on and like just, you know, being there myself, I was like, whoa. And so what, you, what was it like when you walked really, onto the set? Really cool. I was a bit like nervous. I'm like, oh. The, and he's <laughs> usually on his show, Jules Holland, he's a piano player. He used mm. to play in UK Square, he's a piano player. Yeah. And he often has a number of other people on the show. Were there other people on the show when you were there? Yeah, um, Ronnie Wood was there. For, Ronnie Wood. The Rolling Stones. So that, was, that was cool. That was and cool. I, yeah, I kind of made a bit of a like, fool of myself because as soon as I saw him, of course, I had to start pointing and, you know, acting oh. like. <laughs> I don't know. There was this guy from this like, cool band next to me just looking at me like. What's she doing? I've already said this is a fantastic it is, record. So it's great, really yeah. so interesting. It's uh, it's it's diverse. It's great production on it. Great singing on it. And uh, we have the great fortune of having you perform for us later in the show. But for the time being, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to see a good Italian Aussie chick doing it yeah. for us out there. In the good world. luck to you. <laughs> well done. I think it's all all of your grandfather's grappa that's you know given you the voice. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, <just> right. 16. <laughs> yeah, back with more after this. <laughs>